Okay, so we're going to be finishing up with uh, medieval lit today and moving on to um, early modern next time, right? So uh, first three acts of the Tempest, um, I have reading questions I'll give you at the, at the end of class, and Grace, you'll be designing your, you'll be giving us your world design next oh, okay. time. Oh, okay, that's due Wednesday? Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm it today. Oh, um, I mean, if you, if you, do you have it, would you rather do it I now? I have it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, keep yeah, keep tinkering with it and okay, yeah, cool. you can bring it on Wednesday, yeah. Okay, um, the other thing I do want to make sure everybody remembers as well is that uh, we're gonna be meeting outside below the building in the breezeway next time. Right? We won't be we will not be meeting in our usual indoor space. Uh, okay, so does anybody have any questions about anything before we uh, continue here? Hearing none, uh, let's just go ahead and proceed. So um, how this, how this part of the, the story go for you? And rather abruptly. Yes. <laughs> it, it ends extremely abruptly, yes. In fact, if we go to the very last page, <laughs> on page 494, right? When the queen saw her, she asked what was the matter, ellipses, and then nothing. So yeah, um, I warned y'all that this is unfinished. <laughs> so that was not intentional? No, that was not intentional on uh, Chrétien's part. Um, so it's believed that two things may have happened. Um, one is that Philip of Flanders, uh, Chrétien's patron, might have died, and thus the money to continue working on this dried up. Um, or that Chrétien himself died. Um, we really don't know anything about his early life or when he was born, so we have no idea how old he was when he was working on this. Um, so, um, yeah, you know, he could have uh, just up and croaked. Um, it's kind of amusing to imagine him, like, dying mid-sentence and just kind of trailing off with that last word. <laughs> but, but that's probably not what would have happened. I don't know, have any of you, have any of you all ever seen Monty Python and the Holy Grail? Some of them. Okay, you know, there, there's, there's the scene where, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're fighting, the knights are running away from the, the animated Black Beast of Og, and the animator suffers a fatal heart attack, thus making the cartoon peril disappear. <laughs> It's amusing to think of something like that happening here, but it's probably not the case, right? Um, but yeah, the, the upshot is that we don't know how this was supposed to end. We know, it's not, we, we know that it's not supposed to end this way, because one, it does end mid-sentence, and two, it never gets, it promised to get back around to Percival and never does, right? So the second half of this, we get, for the most part, Gawain's adventures and only one scene really featuring the Percival. So what did you make of Gawain's adventures in comparison to Percival's? How do Gawain and Percival differ as characters, for one thing? They have different flaws. They do have different flaws, yes. What does, what was Percival's flaw, at least in the beginning? He was ignorant. Yeah, Percival, um, was ignorant, or, if we want to put it a little bit more nicely, innocent, right? He does not know what he does not know. Um, and he approaches uh, situations uh, with a combination of determination and naivete, right? And he tends to follow instructions from whoever the last person to teach him was. What about Gawain? What do you think Gawain's flaw is?
if Percival is the innocent knight, then what is Gawain in comparison to that? Corrupt. What's that? Corrupt. Um, I'm just thinking of opposite. Yeah. Not, yeah. Not he, very corrupt. Yeah, it, it, it probably isn't fair to say he's corrupt, right? <laughs> But he is, he's experienced, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what does the fact that he is an experienced knight mean for him everywhere he goes? Prideful. What's that? Prideful. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Prideful. Okay, he is a bit, right? He is a bit prideful. People know him, yeah. they know his name. He has a reputation. Yeah, he has a reputation. Right? And because he is an extremely successful knight in a variety of different knightly arenas, what kind of reputation does he have? Okay, yeah. On the one hand, there are people who expect him to do things for them, right? Because, oh, you're, okay, you're Gawain, you're the most famous knight in the world, right? You can do this thing for me, right? So, he has a reputation for being kind of almost superhuman. But what else tends to happen to him when, in just about every place he goes? Well, first off, why does he set off from King Arthur's court to begin with? What is he accused of? We go to page 439. And as they were making their ready and arming themselves throughout the hall, Gingong Brasil strode through the entryway, right? We've, this character has not been introduced before. We have no idea who this person is. This is for the first time he's even mentioned, right? Carrying a shield with an azure bend on a upon a field oar. So um, it's a, a blue design on a gold field is what that is. The bend covered precisely a third of the shield. Gingon Brazil recognized the king and greeted him as was proper, but instead of greeting Gawain, he accused him of felony, saying, Gawain, you killed my lord, and you struck him without issuing a challenge. For this you are disgraced and shamed, and I accuse you of treason. May all the barons acknowledge that I have spoken nothing but the truth. So does this kind of thing happen a lot to Gawain? as he proceeds. Yeah, pretty much every town or village he visits, right? There's somebody there whose relative he has killed or defeated or disgraced, right? So because his, you know, his very work, right, his very being involves violence, he has this reputation as a killer. And there are a lot of people who don't like him very much as a result. Now, what about his reputation with women? How is he usually received by women in the various courts that he visits? This is something that relates to other texts Gowing features in that some of you might be familiar with as well. Is he known just for being a good fighter? What else 
what else is he known for? In fact, not even just among the women. If you look at his interactions with, um, with Percival and then with Sir Kay, how does Gawain get Percival to come to court when Sagamore and Kay have failed to do so through violence? Turn to page 435 here for a second. Can I get somebody to start reading from um, on hearing these words? On hearing these words, Kay grew angry and said, Ha, my lord Gawain, so you'll lead the knight here by the reins, whether he likes it or not. It's all fine and good if he'll let you, and you can get away, and you can get away without a fight. You've captured many a knight in just this way. When the knight's worn out and has had enough of fighting, that's when the brave fighter asks permission to go after him. Going a hundred curses upon my neck if you're not so sly that anyone can learn a lot from you. You know all kinds of flattering and polished words to use. You'll trick the king with deceitful and arrogant talk. A curse upon anyone who'd believe you, for you don't fool me. You could win this fight in a silken tunic. You won't even have to draw your sword or break a lance. You're so conceited that if your tongue is able to say, Sir, may God bless you and give you good health and a long life, He'll do whatever you want. I'm not telling you anything you don't know, for you, for you can mollify him just like stroking a cat. And everyone will say, see how bravely my lord Gawain is fighting? So what does Kay accuse Gawain of here? Being a bullshit artist. <laughs> yeah, basically, exactly. <laughs> and it's not entirely untrue, right? I mean, the way Kay couches it is crass, right? Because K is, you know, that's kind of K's characteristic is that he's, he's rude. Um, but yeah, um, Gawain has a reputation for courteous talk, or as you put it, bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, th 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 this is a knight who is frequently, who is as frequently able to talk himself out of a situation as to fight his way out of it, right? And so this endears him to many of the women he encounters along his, along his journeys, right? So we have on the one hand, uh, you know, we have the, the maiden of the small sleeves. Who is probably too young for there to be any romantic attachment between the two of them, but she's it's suggested that she's more or less still a child. There's also the sister of the Lord whose father he had apparently killed. And he spends a good bit of time in the company of the haughty maiden of Logris. who seems determined to watch him fail, right? Her stated purpose for going with him is to wait for a moment when he humiliates himself so that she can be there to see it, right? So all of this and some of what came before last time relates to a particular literary tradition that we mentioned in brief last time but didn't really get a chance to explain. Um, called Courtly Love for Fina Moore. I heard somebody exclaim something at this. Is this familiar? Somebody familiar with this? Or were you just exhaling loudly? Okay, so the first thing to note about Courtly Love is that this is probably just a literary and artistic tradition. 
we have no evidence that people actually practice this in real life, right? And it first appears in medieval literature in southern France, but it's probably influenced uh, by Arabic love poetry. Um, sorry? Does that say literary? Literary, yeah. Um, does anybody know how Arabic love poetry would have got into southern France in the 12th century? Uh, Muslims come from Carthage to Spain. Exactly, yes. You had uh, the Almohad Empire in North Africa and southern Spain. Um, so yeah, there was cultural contact between the south of France and Spain, and thus, yeah, yeah um, Arabic love poetry kind of filtered out uh, from there, the kind of geographical closeness. Good. It was also influenced to some extent by smutty Latin verse, by writers like Ovid. Um, Ovid uh, wrote a book. Uh, Ovid is best known for his Metamorphoses, or Book of Changes, um, which is a lengthy epic um, about uh, transformation, like it details transformations in Greek and Roman mythology. Um, but he also wrote a book called The Ars Amatores, uh, which was a kind of seduction manual in verse. And that's the, um, that's the work that probably influences this particular tradition. So here's what courtly love looks like. On the one hand, it's aristocratic. Um, it is only something that occurs in literature and art within the upper classes. It is also, by definition, extramarital. Now, this has to do with the nature of medieval European marriage, right? Does anybody know why people got married typically in the 12th century? And who actually got married? To create heirs and to expand borders. Yeah, it's, it, it, yeah it, does, it has to do with land and with keeping land and property in the same family, right? So really only aristocrats actually got married because it was expensive. Um, a woman had to have a dowry in order to get married, and a priest, in order to get a priest to marry you, you had to pay him. Which, if you were, you know, the typical dirt farming serf, you didn't have any money anyway. So, you know, people would still kind of cohabit monogamous, monogamously and have children together, but they usually did not do so with any kind of official legal or religious sanction, right? Um, so marriage, yeah, was, in a, was mostly about preserving property rights. And it was a way that a man made sure that his property passed to his own biological heirs. So it was not, the idea of romantic marriage between uh, companions is a relatively recent historical development, at least in the West. So in this particular tradition, yeah, love, actual love, takes place outside of marriage. And as such, it must also always be secret. All right. Part of the thrill of the courtly love story is the efforts that the lovers go to to prevent their relationship from being discovered. And usually when the relationship is discovered, disaster ensues, right? Because the, the husband is usually more powerful, usually outranks uh, the, his wife's lover, right? 
and can bring resources to bear against him. But here's the weirdest thing about it, right? Courtly love, poetry, imagines love as an ennobling or civilizing force. that inspires men to great deeds. So the basic purpose, the reason why in these kinds of texts a knight takes a lover is really for a kind of spiritual self-improvement, right? By performing great deeds, he attempts to prove himself worthy of his lady. And the lady, who again is usually his social superior, is supposed to continue to refuse him. And consummation of the relationship occurs only when the knight has achieved true greatness. So if we want to think about this in terms of gender dynamics and power, who has the power in this kind of relationship? Who has most of the power? Yeah, the woman has most of the power, right? And yet, As the woman in this relationship exercises her power, is she still is she the central part of this of the story? Yeah, she's basically unchanging, right? The woman remains a kind of static character. Or is the, the knight is the dynamic character who works towards improvement. And he works towards improvement because he's hoping to win a prize at the end, right? Now the process is supposed to make him a better knight and a better man. But the gender dynamics of this are still a little bit strange and complicated, right? The woman has most of the power, but the man seems to get most of the benefits. And the woman also probably puts herself in more danger than the man does in agreeing to the, the, this kind of relationship in the first place. Now, if we look at how this works out in a text like the story of the Grail, um, a little bit of background here is also probably helpful. Um, so, Chrétien had worked for a time at the court of Marie de Champagne, uh, Marie de Champagne. who was known, bless you, as a great patroness of courtly love poets. In fact, it's argued that this whole system was codified at her court. And there was a clergyman 
writing around the same time that Chrétien was working on the story of the Grail uh, by the name of Andreas Capuanus. which is just a fancy Latin way of saying Andrew the Chaplain. And Capulanus wrote a book, the title of which translated into English is The Art of Loving Virtuously. And he completed this sometime between 1186 and 1191, so exactly around the time that Chrétien is working on the story of the Grail at the court of Philip of Flanders. It's not unlikely that these two guys knew each other. And I think that Chrétien uh, is dealing in various ways here with some of Andreas's ideas. Um, and often in a, critical, in a critical sort of light, right? So what would probably be the first example that we have here of what might be is some kind of courtly love entanglement in this text, in the story of the Grail? So, like, so in the story of the Grail, what do you think might be the first example of something similar to a courtly love entanglement? It doesn't have to fit all the characteristics, but. When a person went to that one castle and yeah. Yeah, Blanche Floor, right? Yeah, the uh, woman Percival rescues from the attentions of Angingeron and his master Clamado, right? Um, <clears throat> what's weird about the way? This one oper about about the way this operates though, that seems a little bit off for the whole courtly love well, dynamic. Doesn't she like seek him out like she sneaks into his room and like? Yeah, she comes into his room half naked and climbs into his bed, right, and starts you know <laughs> saying she's going to kill him, kill herself, right, if uh, if he doesn't deliver her city, right. So on the one hand, right, his love for his love for her does drive him to great deeds. But she's the one who does the pursuing, right? She chases after him and convinces him to help, rather than the other, you know, him trying to win her affection through deeds, right? In fact, it's probably more accurate to say that the guy who's trying to take over her city is trying to win her through deeds, right? And we also see that a lot of these attachments in the text seem to be toxic, right? I mean, on the one hand, like, so we've got, you know, Percival and Blanchefleur, um, once he leaves their city, does he ever really seem to, to think that much about her again? As a convenient way of getting, like, kind of, like, uh, catatonic, so that knights can come up and try to slap him off his horse, right? But otherwise, yeah, she doesn't really seem to come back into this. Uh, when we have, you know, the, the knight whom uh, Percival offended by kissing his lady and taking her ring, right? how has he subsequently treated that woman? Yeah, I mean, he, <laughs> I mean if, yeah, I mean, let, let's, let's go to the spot in the narrative where, uh, where Percival meets this guy again. Right, where he exchange, you know, they, they exchange words here, right? Uh, 
Um, you look on page uh, page 426. Can you get somebody uh, to read from Then He Left and She Remained? Then He Left and She Remained for she did not wish to leave the night whose death had brought such sorrow to her heart. Percival followed the tracks he found along the trail until he overtook a lean and weary palfrey walking along ahead of him. The palfrey was so thin and wretched that Percival thought it, would, it had fallen into evil hands. It seemed to be as overworked and ill-fed as a horse that is hired out overtaxed by day and poorly cared for at night. The palfrey appeared just like that. It was so thin that it trembled as if suffering, <clears throat> suffering from glanders. Its mane had all fallen out and it, its ears drooped down. Before long, it would be good only as food for the hounds and mastiffs because there was nothing but, but hide hanging up over its bones. The lady's saddle on its back and the bridle on its mirrored <clears throat> on its head mirrored its own pitiful state. It was being ridden by the most wretched girl you have ever seen. Yet she would have been fair and noble enough had she been better fortune. But she was in such a bad state that there was not a palm's breadth of good material in the dress she wore, and her breasts fell out through the ribs. The dress wood is held together here and there with knots and crude stitches. Her skin looked lacerated as though it had been torn by lancets, and it was pocked and burned by heat and wind and frost. Her hair was loose and she wore no hood so that her face showed with many an ugly <clears throat> trace left by tears rolling ceaselessly down by her cheeks. They flowed across her breasts and out over the dress, down to her knees. Anyone in such affliction might well have a very heavy heart. Okay, so thank you. So do we notice any particular patterns in the description here of the horse and of the woman? What's particularly telling, do you think, about this description? Give it a minute, look it over. Yet she would have been fair and noble enough had she had better fortune. Okay, so this is someone, if we think back to when we talked about with Boethius last time, right? This is someone who, who's on the downturn of the Wheel of Fortune, right? But we also know that that wheel always comes back up. But what about the way her clothes are described? She was, was someone who hurt her. Okay, yeah, the, the, yeah they're, they're what look like lacerations, right? And it's like ripped up. It's ripped up, there are holes in it, right? She has no hood, right? Her face and hair are exposed. Right. Her breasts are falling out through the rips in the dress. So the big thing here, right, is that, yeah, that she is exposed, right? Right, the jealous knight who uh, she travels with, um, <clears throat> I think, is using this as a kind of symbolic punishment. It's like, well, if you'll just let anybody come in and kiss you, right, and take your ring and do what they please with you, then you don't deserve to be covered up in any way, right? You know, let, let's say expose your iniquity to the entire world. But then, if we look, 
at the knight's own description of his reasoning here, right? On page 428, it says, Recently I had gone off into the woods, leaving this damsel in one of my tents, and I loved no one but her. Then, by chance, along came a young Welshman. I don't know where he was headed, but he managed to force her to kiss him, so she told me. If she lied to me, what harm is there in that? But if he even kissed her against her will, wouldn't he have taken advantage of her afterwards? Indeed, yes. And no one will believe he kissed her with, without doing more, for one thing leads to another. If a man kisses a woman and nothing more, when they are all alone together, I think there's something wrong with him. A woman who lets herself be kissed easily gives the rest if, some, if someone insists upon it. And even if she resists, it's a well-known fact that a woman wants to win every battle but this one. Though she may grab a man by the throat and scratch and bite him until he's nearly dead, still she wants to be conquered. She puts up a fight against it, but is eager for it. She is so afraid to give in, she wants to be taken by force, but then never shows her gratitude. Therefore I believe this Welshman lay with her. And he took a ring of mine that she wore upon her finger and carried it off, which makes me angry. But before that he drank and ate his fill of the hearty wine and three meat pies I had put aside for myself. But now my love has a splendid reward, as you can see. Anyone who makes a mistake must pay for it, so he won't make it again. You can imagine my anger when I returned and learned what had happened. And I swore, and rightly so, that her palfrey would have no oats and would not be reshot or groomed, and that she would have no other tunic or mantle than what she was wearing then, until I had defeated, killed, and decapitated the one who raped her. So, is the knight at all worried here about the insult the Welshman did to the damsel? No. Not at all, right? What is he concerned with instead? That he was disrespectful. Yeah, it's about his own honor, right? That in coming into my tent, and kissing my lady and eating my meat pies, right? He dishonored and disrespected me. I think, you know, that's, I think part of the issue is that he's as angry about the meat pies as he is about anything else, right? So for him, it's a matter of personal honor rather than a matter of actual love, right? As we can also see that this guy is viewpoint, while not unusual for the time period, is pretty relentlessly misogynistic as well, right? He doesn't seem to have a very high opinion of women. So is this guy someone whom love has ennobled? Yeah, what, what has it done to him? How has it made him behave? It's made him cruel and jealous, right? Or, I mean, perhaps he was cruel and jealous anyway. But I think the bigger point here is that this love affair doesn't make him any better, right? There is no ennobling here. And when we look at uh, Gawain's later interactions with the haughty maid of Logris, How willingly does this woman follow him? What does she want to happen to Gawain? Turn to page 462. Can I get somebody to read the paragraph that says, My Lord Gawain entered the castle by crossing a bridge, down at the bottom of the page.
My Lord Gawain entered the castle by crossing a bridge, and when he had climbed to the strongest place in all the castle, in a garden beneath an elm, he found a maiden all alone gazing in a mirror at her face and neck, which were whiter than snow. Her head was encircled by a narrow brand of orphrey. My lord Gawain spurred his horse to a canter towards <coughs> the maiden, and he shout, <clears throat> and she shouted to him, Slow down, slow down. Go easy, you're riding too recklessly. You shouldn't hurry so and quicken your horse's pace. Only a fool rushes up for no reason. Okay, thank you. So pause there for a moment, right? So when he first comes upon this maiden, what's she doing? Yeah, she's staring at herself in a mirror, right? So what do you think that is supposed to tell us about her? She's admiring her own face and neck in a mirror. Yeah, vanity and self-regard, right? And can we continue from Maiden said my Lord Galloway? Maiden said my Lord Galloway, may you be blessed by God. Tell me, more, <coughs> dear friend, what you were thinking when you, without reason, cautioned me to slow down. I do have one. I swear, Sir Knight, for I know just what you are thinking. What then, he asked. You want to grab me and carry me down this hill across your horse's neck. That's right, damsel. I knew it well, said she. Cursed be any man who thinks that. Be careful never to try to put me on your horse. I'm not one of those silly girls the knights sport with and carry away on their horses when they go out seeking adventure. You'll never carry me on your horse. Okay, thank you. So we can, we can stop there, right? So, how is she defeating Gawain's expectations here? She's not like other girls. She's not going to just like call for any of his like tricks or things. Yeah. Well, and, and, and indeed, like, like, what, what is it? What is it that he literally wants to do? <laughs> what, 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 what was his plan here? To carry her across the way. Yeah. You want to grab me and carry me down this hill across your horse's neck. That's right, damsel. Right? <laughs> he, he doesn't deny this, right? So what she's doing here is refusing to be a token in this kind of like knightly game of one-upmanship of, you know, who has the fairest damsel, right? Or who has the fairest lady. She's refusing to play uh, the usual courtly love um, game here. Right? And I think that a lot of Gawain's actions are represented in terms of games in this second half of the narrative. Right? There's the point you know, where he's trying to defend himself and uh, the, uh, his, his new love uh, from the villagers. On page 453, Right. She hurried to fetch him his armor, for she was not feeling at all safe. When she had armed him fully, both she and my lord Gawain were less afraid, except that as luck would have it, there was no shield to be found. So my lord Gawain made a shield from a chessboard and said, Friend, I don't want you to look for any other shield for me. Then he overturned the chessboard, which had ivory pieces, ten times heavier than other pieces of the hardest bone. Henceforth, whatever might happen... He felt he could defend the doorway and entry to the tower, for he had Excalibur strapped to his side, the best sword ever made, which cut iron as if it were wood. So he's using a chessboard as a shield here.
there is a point at which he goes into the castle of marbles. On page 475, right, so the two of them passed by him and came to the great hall with its very high entryway. Its gate was splendid and beautiful, for the hinges and catches were of pure gold, as the source testifies. One of the doors was ivory, with beautifully carved panels. The other was ebony, likewise with carved panels. And each one was highlighted by gold leaf and magical gems. So the color scheme here matches the colors, the white and black color scheme of a chessboard, right? this place where he is um, going to undergo this test on the bed of marble, the bed of marvels, and then involuntarily become lord of this castle, right? And there is another point, I can't find it here now, and I really should have marked it. I think I did mark it, I just can't find it. Where there's a reference to a uh, checkmate Right, um, page 484, uh, when he runs into the maiden again after she brings her friend the knight to try to beat him up. She says, ah, knight, she said, look how happy and proud you are. But you've had more than you could handle if my friend had not been weakened by old wounds. Your proud words would have been silenced, your babbling tongue hushed, and you'd have been as silent as a checkmated king in the corner. So... <clears throat> There are all these references here to chess. And this reference to Gawain as a checkmated king, which suggests to me that as this narrative kind of developed, it would have been primarily about attempts to trap Gawain like sort of to checkmate him in the corner of the board um, <clears throat> through the use of his reputation for violence, um, his weakness for women, um, and his inability to resist the urge to do these kinds of great deeds, right? So what we have with Gawain is as opposed to Percival, kind of like the ideal worldly knight, right? Gawain is the best worldly knight, but that worldliness is itself a kind of trap, right? Everywhere he goes, he just keeps getting embarrassed and getting into trouble. And I think that Percival is intended to be the counterpoint to that. And that Percival's adventures are supposed to demonstrate the attributes of the spiritual knight as he develops, right? He certainly starts off confusing the worldly with the spiritual, as we talked about last time, but gets corrected in this particular branch of the narrative. So let's look at Percival's uh, encounter with the hermit. Can we get to um, page 457, uh, the passage starting with Percival, the story relates. Percival, the story Thank relates, you. I lost his memory so totally 
that he no longer remembered God. April and May passed five times, that was five full years, without, hap without his having entered a church or adored God or his cross. Five years he remained like this, yet in spite of everything, he never ceased to pursue deeds of chivalry. He sought out the most difficult, treacherous, and unusual adventures, and found enough to test his valor, never undertaking any venture that he was unable to accomplish. In the course of five years, he sent 60 worthy knights as prisoners to King Arthur's court. So he passed the five years without ever thinking of God. Okay, thank you. So how has Percival, so Percival had vowed to go questing to discover who the Grail served, right? And how's that going for him? He's doing all kinds of other shit, right? But he seems to have lost sight of that original purpose. So how has he been spending his time? What's he been doing? Over the course of these five years. Keeps meeting new people and getting distracted. Like, yeah. Journeys, new people to, to beat up and get in prison, right? Yes. Yeah. And but the whole thing about knights capturing each other um, rather than killing each other, that was actually fairly common. It was actually more common in medieval warfare for knights to try to capture each other. Because if you captured someone, you could take his horse and armor, and you could ransom him to, for, uh, to his family, right? So, you know, you could make a lot more money capturing people than you could by killing them. Also, because uh, the European aristocracy was horribly inbred, um, a lot of knights were related to each other, um, whichever side of the battle they happened to be on. So there was often also a kind of a, a reluctance um, to kill your third cousin in battle, right? You know, it's, okay, well, I'll capture him, I'll let his family pay his ransom, and then we're good again. But yeah, so Percival has spent most of the last five years fighting and doing great deeds of various sorts, which we can assume mostly involve fighting. Right, the kinds of things a worldly knight does. And then can I get somebody to continue from at the end of the five years? At the end of the five years, it happened that he was riding through a deserted region, armed as usual in all his armor, he met three knights, and with them, as many as ten ladies, their heads covered by hoods. They were all walking barefoot and wearing hair shirts. The ladies were amazed to find him fully armed and bearing his shield and lance, since they, to secure the salvation of their souls, were doing penance on foot for the sins they had committed. Uh, do you all know what a hair shirt is, by the way? Okay, so a hair shirt, was it's a garment made from the skin of an animal, but it's not like the... The hair is left on and is placed on the inside of the garment. So you, the bristles are rubbing up against your skin while you're wearing the shirt. It was something that um, in the Middle Ages and the early modern period, people would often wear as a kind of penance, right? Like, I'm going to wear this incredibly uncomfortable, itchy garment to mortify my flesh, right? So that's what's going on here. They're wearing these hair shirts, these humble and extremely itchy garments um, as a form of penance. Okay, keep going. One of the three knights stopped him and said, My good sir, do you not believe in Jesus Christ, who established the new law and gave it to Christmas? Christians? <laughs> Indeed, it is not proper or good, but very wrong to bear arms on the day when Jesus died. Mm, yep, go ahead. And Percival who was so troubled in his heart that he had no idea of the day or hour or time, said, What day is it today, then? What day, sir? You don't know? It is Good Friday, when one should worship the cross and lament for one's sins. Because on this day, the man who was sold for thirty pieces of silver was hung upon the cross. He who was guiltless of any sin looked down on the sins that ensnared and stained all mankind, and became man for our sins. It is true that he was God and man, that the virgin gave birth to a son conceived by the Holy Spirit, in whom God assumed flesh and blood, 
and that his divinity was concealed under the flesh of man. All this is certain, and whoever does not believe this will never see him face to face. He was born of the Virgin Lady and took the soul and body of man in addition to his holy divinity. And on a day like today, in truth, he was nailed upon the cross and delivered all his friends from hell. This was truly a holy death which saved the living and brought the dead back to life. Okay, we can pause there. You don't have to read the uh, medieval anti-Semitic screed that uh, Chrétien puts in there. Um, unfortunately, this uh, particular viewpoint was essentially a, a, a official church doctrine in the Middle Ages, right? You know, that the, the, the Jews were, were responsible for the death of Jesus and thus... Um, deserving um, only of death and hellfire. So, yeah, that's uh, some good, good old-fashioned good old medieval Catholicism for you, right? Um, th their attitudes towards women were much better. Um, but yeah, so we've got Percival here as, once again, he's in a deserted region, right? So another wasteland. like where he met the Fisher King. And here he is again being informed by a knight, right? But what has, what has, what's Percival doing right this time that he didn't do in the castle of the Fisher King? He asked a question. Yeah, he's asking questions. He's like the inquisitive innocent again that he was at the beginning of the romance, who didn't know what a shield was and didn't know what a lance was or a chain hauberk or any of these things that these knights are, are wearing or carrying. But now he's no longer an innocent, he's, it's no longer chivalry that, it's, that he's innocent about, right? It's now religion, it's now spirituality in these innocent. And so he's being initiated onto a different quest. And <clears throat> this quest leads him to this holy hermit, right? Page 459. Percival set out on the path, sighing deep within his heart, because he, had, he felt he had sinned against God and was very sorry for it. Weeping, he went through the thicket, and when he came to the hermitage, he dismounted and removed his armor. He tied his horse to a hornbeam and entered the hermit's cell. In a small chapel, he found the hermit with a priest and a young cleric, this is the truth, who were just beginning the service, the highest and sweetest that can be said in holy church. Percival knelt down as soon as he entered the chapel, and the good hermit called him over to him, for he saw he was humble and penitent, and that the tears flowed from his eyes right down to his chin. And Percival, who was very much afraid that he had sinned against Almighty God, took the hermit by the foot, bowed before him, and with hands clasped begged him to give him absolution, for he felt in great need of it. The good hermit told him to make his confession, for he would never be forgiven if he did not first confess and repent. Sir, said Percival, it has been over five years since I have known where I was going, and I have not loved God or believed in him, and all I have done has been evil. So, the rite here of confession, right, the sacrament of confession is important in this context. Why? What does confession allow you to do? Yeah. It's unburdening yourself and giving yourself a clean slate, right? You tell the priest, you, you tell the priest what your sins were, he, you know, makes a sign of the cross and says a couple of prayers over you. You probably have to go do something yourself then, right? And then you're absolved of those sins. Yeah, what confession offers you then is a kind of clean slate for starting over. So what we're supposed to be seeing here, I think, is a kind of is a new beginning for Percival that just never gets developed because the romance ends, up, you know, ends unfinished.
Ah, dear friend, said the worthy man, tell me why you acted in this manner, and pray God to have mercy upon the soul of his sinner. Sir, I was once at the manor of the fisher king, and I saw the lance whose point bleeds beyond doubt, and I never asked about this drop of blood I saw suspended from the white iron tip. I've done nothing since then to make amends, and I've never learned who was served from the grail I saw. Since that day, I have suffered such affliction that I would rather have died. I forgot Almighty God and never implored him for mercy, and I've not consciously done anything to merit his forgiveness. Ah, dear friend, said the good man, now tell me your name. And he answered, Percival, sir. At this word the hermit sighed, for he recognized the name and said, Brother, a sin of which you are unaware has caused you much hardship. It is the sorrow your mother felt at your departure from her. She fell in a faint on the ground at the head of the bridge in front of the gate, and she died from this sorrow. On account of this sin of yours, it came about that you did not ask about the lance or the grail, and many hardships have come to you in consequence. And understand that you would not have lasted until now had she not commended you to God. But her prayer was so powerful that God watched over you for her sake and kept you from death and imprisonment. And I think this actually bears some unpacking too, right? So the sin of which Percival was unaware is what? Yeah, causing the death of his mother, right? And how did he cause the death of his mother? He left to do what? Yeah. So as he goes off to become, so his going off to become a knight is the reason his mother dies, right? Sin stopped your tongue when you saw pass in front of you the lance that bleeds unceasingly and failed to ask its purpose. When you did not inquire who has served from the grail, you committed folly. The man served from it is my brother. Your mother was his sister and mine. And the rich fisher king, I believe, is the son of the king who has served from the grail. So there's a family relationship here right, to map out. So we have Percival's mother, the hermit, and the Fisher King's father. Who are all siblings, right? which means that the relationship between Percival and the Fisher King is what? Mm, the Fisher King's father is Percival's uncle, right? Yeah, they're first cousins, yeah. So what we have here is something that is actually not that uncommon in medieval romances, um, particularly of the Arthurian story, of the discovery of a previously unknown family, right? Something, uh, something similar happens at the end of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, um, where Gawain discovers um, <clears throat> that one of the motivating forces behind the events that happened to him is his aunt. Um, whom he was previously unaware of. But yeah, so we have here the discovery of a family relationship. That was previously unknown to the hero. So what's happening here is that he's kind of being initiated into his own real identity. The problem is, again, we never see how this develops. Because Chrétien promises he's going to come back to Percival and then never does. 
Now, do we actually see something similar happen to Gawain before all this is over? Is Percival the only one who discovers an unknown family here? Yeah, Gawain is, is Arthur's nephew. Yeah. So that he knows, right? So he's identified thus far pretty much exclusively with the masculine line of descent here. Right? with a male relative. He is the king's nephew. But when he comes to this castle, we look on page 480, the queen comes to speak to him. Right, he greeted her, and she him, saying, Sir, after you, I am lady of this place. I yield you its lordship, for you have well merited it. But are you from the household of King Arthur? My lady, I am indeed. And are you, I'd like to know, one of the knights of the king's watch who have done so many deeds of prowess? I am not, my lady. As you say, then tell me, are you a knight of the round table, one of the most highly esteemed in the world? My lady, he answered, I wouldn't dare say that I'm one of the most esteemed. I don't count myself among the best, nor do I think I'm one of the worst, right? False modesty. It's well established that Gawain is extremely famous, right? And she replied, Noble sir, these are courteous words that I hear. When you don't accord yourself the praise, do the best, nor the blame, do the worst. But tell me now about King Lot. How many sons did he have by his wife? Four, my lady. Tell me their names. My lady, Gawain is the eldest. The second is Agravain, the proud knight with strong hands. Gaharis and Gareth are the names of the last two. And again the queen spoke, Sir, as God is my support, it seems to me those are indeed their names. Would to God they were all here with us now. Tell me now, do you know King Urien? So on and so forth. Um, let's see. Uh, so the upshot here is that the queen who is questioning him is his grandmother and knows the answers to these questions, right? and knows really who it is that she's talking to. So, <clears throat> she is Arthur's mother. And she is also the mother of Gawain's mother, who is known here really only as uh, King Lot's wife. And Gawain also learns that he has a, a much younger sister. Who has been born and raised here since after the death of his father. So we have here, so Percival actually discovers a male family, right? Though it's a spiritually inclined male family. Gawain discovers an entirely female family. And what's different about Gawain's response to his female relative? What, what does Percival say when his uncle asks him who he is? When Percival's uncle, the hermit, asks, you know, what is your name? What does he say? Percival. I am Percival, yeah. He owns up freely who he is, right? What does Gawain say? when his grandmother asks him who he is. Is he honest about his identity? He out and out lies, right? 
claims to be a lesser knight than he really is, and even insists that they not ask his identity for seven days, right? So <clears throat> one thing that kind of would have been interesting to watch here right, is why the secrecy on Gawain's part and the openness on Percival's part. And I think that it has to do with the different directions in which their stories are tending, right? That Gawain's story seems to be mostly about the consequences of worldliness and um, the pursuit of secular goals and secular good. And Percival's story seems instead to be about throwing all that aside in pursuit of some larger spiritual goal. But that's really just kind of a best guess since you know, Chrétien didn't give us an answer here, right? So we are about out of time. Does anybody have any questions about any of this? All right, so next time we are going to be visiting a small Mediterranean island with a wizard and monsters. And a bunch of shipwrecked Italians. <laughs>